Stacy? Why do you do what? this to yourself? Who is How long can you keep Just play up? the game. It's what you always do. Why does he do this? How long can you keep this? He's always thinking of her. She won't forgive you. She? Silverload is a European first-person point-and-click spaghetti western horror adventure game developed by Cygnosis Limited and released in 1995 for MS-DOS. So here's the deal, I've played a lot of these western games. How many? Check it out. Despite an interesting concept and some unique visuals, Silverload was almost universally berated for a number of flaws, some inherent with old school point and click adventure games, and others that are sort of just inexcusable out and out fuck ups. They figured the best course of action would be to re release it in the US this time, because the US is full of dummies that like dumb shit. So a year later, the game was ported to the PlayStation. Well, ported is a poor choice choice of words because they actually seemingly went to great lengths to almost completely rework the game before bringing it to consoles, drastically altering nearly everything about it but the story. And this will be the version I focus the review on a bit more, since it's sort of the definitive version, and it's slightly more anomalous than the DOS version, but I'll be referencing it along the way. This rebranding didn't do much to quell the stream of bad reviews, but critics were noticeably more forgiving of certain aspects. It was also one of only about 120 or so early PlayStation releases to be shipped out in the cardboard long boxes. It was something that always confused me and that I feel a lot of people don't remember, but PlayStation games on launch were released in the big plastic Sega Saturn cases that often easily broke and made a horrific squealing noise when opened, and then only months later switched to a similarly sized plastic and cardboard rendition with weird ridges going down the side. The third iteration removed the ridged spine and replaced it with an image of the ridged spine, which carried over to the fourth and final packaging iteration, the classic jewel case. And look, as someone with a weird fixation on consistent formatting, this was torturous. This is pure agony. Thank you for indulging me in my backdoor pilot for my mini-series, Video Game Packaging, A Criticism, colon, The Government Feeds Us Lies. Right off the bat, both the DOS version and the PS1 version of Silverload have a peculiar and I feel unsuccessful introduction to this story, which, were it arranged and presented a little more intelligently, might actually be kind of entertaining. The DOS version opens with an awkward comic book style animatic of two side characters that enter the story shortly before the protagonist's arrival. These are two anthropologists named Leo Remington and Carl Whitehead, who are tipped off to the presence of some cursed Native American relics that they would really get a kick out of desecrating, you know, really spit on the graves of one of the most consistently conquered people on earth. When they are shown the remains, there is evidence that these people were murdered, and probably by the people of the town. Carl, being the more skeptical one, is unnerved by this, and notices everyone seems to have wolf-like features. He tries to prod the locals for answers, which results in him being chased around by werewolves and eventually bitten by a little girl. The PS1 version replaces this animatic with a neat but meaningless cutscene of a vulture flying around before handing over control to you. This is where we meet our protagonist, Cowboy Man, a half Native American, half white gunslinger who happens upon a caravan that has just been attacked outside the town of Silverload. One of the survivors says that they were attacked by monsters and his son was kidnapped, so he implores you to help retrieve him. And not having much else to do that day, Cowboy Man heads over to Silverload to inquire about the missing boy. At the gates, this happens. Be gone from here. Both versions have this head. Go back! I, I, I don't know why he said that or why he appeared as a disembodied head, so fuck off. In the DOS version, there is a man you meet on the path to town who also tells you that you shouldn't be here. It's kind of redundant. And on the way to town, and indeed several times throughout the story, we will cut to a meanwhile scene where we mostly see a static image of our antagonist, a preacher who has assumed control of the town, conspiring against you and the missing anthropologists. The cowboy man decides to stay the night at the local inn and through a secret door in his room meets up with Leo Remington, where he is hiding and going insane with paranoia, and rightfully so since the town does seem to be actively seeking to kill him. 
There is already a lot here that I find bothersome, mainly that the pieces are here to have something tense and mysterious, but they are jumbled around in a way that extinguishes that potential. I see a latent Lovecraftian build of horror here, and I almost wish the focus was on the two anthropologists, because their experiences seem reminiscent of something like The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Two intellectual city folk types show up to an isolated country town, for a while are treated cordially despite the appearance and behavior of the locals being unnerving. In their attempts to unravel the true goings-on, they provoke the locals to reveal their true nature, and they try essentially to silence them and prevent them from spreading word about their clandestine motives. Which, uh, knowing Lovecraft, those motives were probably on the surface a spooky death cult, uh, but the subtext being a, a race of people that he didn't have a particular fondness for. I I'm sure he would come up with a more classy way to completely dehumanize them by calling them adumbrations of the pithecanthropoid or something. <laughs> but both versions make it clear that we're here for a more lighthearted and quaint experience. One with all the classic Halloween trappings. We're talking cobwebs, spooky skulls, graveyards, Frankenstein monsters. In truth, th this is not without its appeal, without its charm, I just see a yearning for more here that is not being fulfilled. The cowboy man questions a cast of colorful characters in his search for the missing boy, including Sheila, who lives above the local saloon. She is the only one in town who seems to want to help you, but is also under the boot heel of the corrupt town sheriff. Also, she is a werewolf, so there is some trust that needs to be built before we- Oh, we're just gonna sleep in the same bed as her? Okay. Okay. That's disgusting, man. I wouldn't eat too much of that stuff, you hear me, brother? You find out pretty unceremoniously that around 20 years ago, the town was built around a silver mine on land belonging to Native Americans and ready to become a prosperous, wealthy community. However, after a hunting party cleared out the area's wolf population, they were visited by the land's rightful owners, questioning about the disappearance of the wolves. The town preacher convinces the sheriff and mayor that the natives would need to be wiped out as well because they were ungodly. So they set about murdering all of them, women and children included. Because this guy looks like he knows what he's talking about. Looks trustworthy, reliable. In the midst of their working up a number six on them, they fail to kill the tribe's shaman, who concocts an ironic curse for them. One that makes silver painful and even deadly to the touch. And of course, turns all inhabitants of the town into werewolves. Uh, the back of the box says also vampires, so maybe some of them are vampires. Also, it turns out Cowboy Man has a closer relationship to the atrocities committed in Silverload than he thinks, and you can probably piece that together on your own. Whatever you're thinking right now, it's probably that. This game's story is pretty silly and outdated like a lot of classic adventure games, but it certainly retains some charm for fans of the format. It has opportunities to ascend above mediocrity, but it barrels towards it every chance it gets. I don't mean to say it doesn't warrant revisiting or remaking because it's a fun story. Just don't expect anything legitimately horrific, intense, or serious. It's a goofy adventure, and by that grading curve, it's a passable one. I mean, if we're isolating the story and just referring to, to that, then yes, passable. I feel like an exceptional story could be cobbled together from reworking bits of both the DOS and PS1 version. I like the idea of the comic book panel cutscenes, but they are not done well and dispel the potential tension of a werewolf reveal. That's an important thing to werewolf media. You gotta have a good reveal. Even Pinocchio knew that. And they only happen the one time, so it seems odd that that wouldn't be a consistent style choice. Werewolf stories, I think, work best with a slow burn until you get that shocking transformation scene. Silverload has a rather well done transformation scene, but we already know so much about everything at this point. I already understand that there are werewolves in the town. If this was the first concrete evidence of them, then that might have been more effective. But I already seen them. I know they're there. Cat's out of the bag. It's like that car parked across the street. I know you can hear me! They probably got ears all over this place! You don't think I can see you? If you've been paying attention to this footage I've been using, you might notice a weird trend where it looks like I don't know how to move around. So in order to explain myself here, I need to quickly jump into being kind of harsh, which I don't take pleasure in doing. I don't take pleasure in most things. It's uh, 
It's a, it's a problem. In order to explain to you how much the PS1 version of Silverload's gameplay is fundamentally flawed, you should be made aware of how already flawed the PC version was. So, just looking at it, it looks like it operates in much the same way early point-and-click adventure games do. In some ways, it actually progresses the genre. In 1995, the use of dumb cursors, or cycling through different cursor types depending on what action you want to take, were beginning to be phased out. The PC version includes the facade of this mechanic, but the cursors change automatically depending on what you mouse over. So if you need to operate something, just hovering over that thing will turn the cursor into the operate cursor. This change, unfortunately, does not make navigating the game all that easier. The issue is twofold. On one hand, the cursors themselves are all bulky, inconvenient shapes. So discerning where the point of the pointer is, is frequently confusing. Most people understand that, you know, when you're using a mouse, it's the, the tip of the arrow that's going to be the thing that you use to point to things, and you click on them, but I don't know where the point is on a boot. I still don't. This problem persists on the PS1 version, and is exponentially more frustrating because not only are the cursors even bigger and more oblong, dumb cursor rules are reinstated, so you do need to cycle through cursors, and the hotspots determining what you can click on are so imperceptible, I spent the entire length of the game doing this. You know what this is? You know what I'm doing? I'm just trying to move around. I'm trying to find the two pixel by two pixel area that will accept input with a big stupid boot with no point in order to just move to a different goddamn location. This is the second half of it. Not only are you using a big stupid boot where you don't know where the point is to click on vague hotspots whose placements are baffling, but on top of all this, so little of the point and click gameplay is actually intuitive or understandable. The game is full of moments where there is nothing informing what you should click on, so of course you just start clicking on things. But even if you've clicked on something, you might not have clicked on it right where you need it to. At one point, I needed to, in sequence, take a scroll off of a bookshelf and then push the bookshelf to the side. But by happenstance, I found the hotspot to move the bookshelf before I found the one that picked up the scroll. And once I moved it, I wasn't able to pick up the scroll at all. And trying to move the shelf back only resulted in Cowboy Man saying this. <clears throat> Moves, but will not move any further. The DOS version has these speech bubbles that come up with important topics or options. And one of the first ones you encounter is at the inn where this guy asks you, do you want to stay in a hotel room or in the stables? Now, being a classy gentleman myself, I would prefer to stay in that hotel room. And I'd like you to just take a look at where my little dagger cursor is positioned. Now, in my eyes, I don't see how I could be any more hovering over the word room. Tell me why I ended up sleeping in that god dang stable. Like I'm some kind of animal. This is important stuff to me. These are things most games just intuitively understand. You need to know how to click on things. You need to know what you can click on. And you need to know when you've clicked on something. This is framework. My thoughts on everything about this game might be different if this was addressed. In this heavily altered near remake re-release. It makes no fucking sense. I hope I've made my point that there is no reason a game like this should be this difficult to navigate. It's like everything is working against this game to make it as incomprehensible as possible. I don't understand the layout of the town. I'd often forget which pixel I needed to click on to go to an area that hadn't been relevant for a while. I have a generally awful sense of direction in real life, so it wasn't enjoyable being reminded of that in a Wild West adventure game. And if you're here because you wanted to shoot werewolves, I mean, you might be disappointed. It, it, that's, that's technically a thing you can do. And, and here is a full clip of every moment you spend shooting werewolves werewolves in this game. That was it. That was exactly 10 seconds. You know what? I'll admit, the shooting segments are fun. In the PS1 version, going into a shootout puts you in a 3D on-rail segment akin to an arcade shooter. And I hate to admit it, 
but they were the most fun part of this. Maybe if the rest of the game functioned properly, I'd be saying different, but I liked shooting these dudes. It was a welcome break from procedure, especially because these segments just worked as they should. They do exactly what they should do. There are other aspects of gameplay that approach something clever but never entirely take full advantage of them. In this version, in order to pass through the desert, you still need the compass and the goggles, but you actually equip both of them. The goggles appear on your profile pic and actually dim the colors in the game. You follow the compass arrow to find the correct path to Silverload. That's nice, that's fun, but mechanics like this don't show up for the rest of the game. In fact, the ability to hold things in your hand is only further used to clumsily combine items in your inventory. I also like that you have to collect money to buy ammo, healing items, and other supplies you might need later down the road. Why don't you take some of this and see if anything happens? I don't think so. If you're running out of money, you can always play dice with a gambler in the saloon. You can even cheat at this by acquiring a pair of loaded die off a corpse. And though omitted from the PS1 version, you also have the option of murdering him, which I'm fine with since he's not the best representation of my heritage. You cheat on me? You swap my dices? So what is this, fajitas? This guy actually provided me with one of many roadblocks I came across. See, I never knew that I could check how much money I had by dragging my money bag over my profile pic. So I was beginning to assume I just had unlimited resources. But pretty soon, I needed to buy medicine and couldn't. So I figured out you could gamble to earn more money. But the thing is, you have to have at least a dollar to bet money. Or he offers you the option to bet one of the items in your inventory. So I went through my inventory and it, it was an odd feeling because I don't know which of these items are vital to completing this game. I would assume the game wouldn't let me lose vitally important items. So I thought, what's the most non-essential of these? Which can I see not becoming useful in the future? So naturally I gravitated towards the Bible, but he didn't want that. So my next thought was, okay, they probably want me to use something that seems really important because I've saved it anyway and can just load it if I lose. So I offered my gun and... Why do you want me to do it? I'm starting to get angry now, guys. So I end up cycling through just about every one of the 200,000 items I have before he accepts the compass. I feel like, could we not have just added a line of dialogue where he says, that's a nice compass or something. Clue me into anything. It's making me feel like a dummy and I don't like it. Even the death screen makes you feel like a dummy. What is that? Talk about kicking me when I'm down. It's not enough that I'm dead, you've wished eternal suffering beyond death. And it's not like somebody from the story is wishing it. That's the game. That's the developers. That is on their own how they feel about me. I know it. They hate you. They wish you were dead. She's with Stacy. He misses her. What's he doing now? Does he think that will help? He won't help. He's hopeless. I'm home. I was excited to get here because even though I know it's entertaining to uh, make the yucks at a game's expense, that's not what I set out to do. I derive more gratification from playing an enjoyable game and talking about that experience than I do complaining about one that I felt didn't work. So it is with great relief that I can talk about something I enjoyed a lot, which is how this game looks and the atmosphere it presents. It's in this interesting and almost complicated looking middle ground of graphics that includes pixel art, rotoscoping, drawings, photographs, computer graphics. It's a real collage of styles that sometimes makes it seem uneven, but everything is pleasant to look at in a nostalgic sense. Environments are vibrantly colored and exceptionally lit. There is a real eye for detail and polish while using what was already becoming an outdated medium. It just has a really unique look to it, like it's perpetually either dawn or dusk. As I said in the story segment, and will now repeat with less hostility, this is classic cutesy spookiness, and the designers make every effort to fill the environments with creepy business, or draw your eyes to some macabre visual. A lot of hanging bodies and jars with preserved eyeballs and shit. It's a lot of fun. The PS1 version also drastically improves the voice acting and adds voice acting to nearly every word. Most performances in the DOS version are less than ideal, especially considering how bare they sound without any music or sound effects accompanying them. <coughs> Thank you.
Damn you all! Everyone does a great job in this version, though, and a lot of the characters give enjoyable, campy, and over-the-top performances. Gather your foot soldiers together for the last time, and stop him from reaching the church. Both versions are sorely lacking music, and the PS1 version doesn't even carry over the actually really great theme song that goes on way too long. Let me show you what hell is. Hell is a friend with no smile. Fuck, man. Tear it up. What replaces music are a variety of bare bones ambience tracks that include old standbys like Wind and Distant Wolf Howls. Look, I'm not gonna pretend to know how to criticize this. It, uh, it does what it needs to do, I guess. But, but you know what? I don't know why I said that. I don't know if it does what it's supposed to do. Is what it's supposed to do mimic uh, the natural ambient sound of nature? I don't think it's doing that. I think it failed at that. And I think part of the reason of that is that you can hear the f***ing clicking because I don't know where to go. Silverload was a deeply flawed PC game that puzzlingly spawned a visually unique but further flawed reworking for PlayStation 1. Both share the bones of something creative and inventive, but neither releases fully see those ideas woven into flesh. There is a lot to love about the game's visuals and voice acting, some entertaining story beats, and the 3D shooting sequences are actually more fun than they have any right to be. You're also going to see a lot of strange inconsistencies between the two versions, and alterations that border on censorship. In one of the more non-sequitur uh, sp spooky moments they throw at you, you'll come across two kids eating a pig, and this is a lot more graphic for the two seconds of screen time they show it in the DOS version, and in the PlayStation version it's very clearly an FMV video of two kids, and it's, it's, uh, it's, I mean it's more like, it's just kind of cute than anything else. A lot of the story and gameplay seems mishandled though, and it feels like not much was done to storyboard or plot out how this arc would unfold. The point and click adventure aspect of the gameplay, and essentially the core of its gameplay, are near broken with how esoteric and impenetrable the basics of navigation and interaction can be. The developers assumed its audience would have some kind of second sight to perceive the completely illogical network of item combinations to progress. How would it ever make sense to unsolicited, mind you, use a pair of tongs on this very specific part of a statue to receive a medal you would need to use near the final moments of the game. It wouldn't. Nothing tells you to do this, and nothing would bring you to that thought on your own. That being said, of course, there is in general a nostalgic charm to the experience of playing Silverload, and fans of the era and genre would absolutely benefit from experiencing it. Look it up on eBay and never mind, do not do that! Uh, uh, look, if you're resourceful enough and want to play it enough, you, you'll figure out how to. Don't do it. She's gonna make it worse. She wants it. Do you think she remembers you? Why is he doing that? He's hurting. He wants her to know. He knows 